Well, this morning I uh, <clears throat> wrap up this series I've been doing on healing, and as you've heard me say over the course of the last few weeks, it certainly is one of the most difficult sub subjects and topics to get into. It raises so many questions that at times are seemingly unanswerable. It is certainly not a simple black and white topic, and we all, all of us here today, are in need of healing in a variety of different ways and places in our lives. A lot of us have seen healing happen, yet most of us here have experienced poignant passages in which it felt our prayers remained unanswered. Most of us here today have witnessed what suffering looks like. And I have to say that as a minister in the four parishes that I have served, I have been around and involved in responding to Countless deaths, suicides, accidents, horrible illnesses, assaults, addictions, despair, unabated mental torment, incarcerations, and demolition derby relationships. And I say this because I want to highlight <clears throat> that it is so clear to me that we, as humankind, are in need of healing and that the need for healing is vast. But through our questions and our doubts, one thing is clear and evident, and that is that God is a healer. And while there are many sources behind this statement, as I've gotten into in the last few weeks, scripture, a story about real people, people in many ways like you and me, is full of examples of the extraordinary healing power of God. Jesus brought healing into the lives of many, many people. And the profiles of those who were healed and how they were healed and the results of such healings are as varied as the people themselves. But across all of those lives is the singular truth, and that is that Jesus was and continues to be an astonishing healer. Now, we've covered a lot of ground in the last two weeks, the notes of which are in your bulletin. And as I've quoted from a variety of sources, we have delved into the difference between healing and curing. That healing can happen without curing and that curing, in fact, can happen without healing. That as one person points out, curing is about changing reality. Healing is about embracing it. Cure seeks to conquer pain, healing to transcend it. Curing fosters functioning, healing fosters purpose. And healing takes place at different levels. And healing can happen both in life and in death. We also pointed out that when we're hurting or another person we love is in pain, that a lot of questions are raised for us. And for those reasons, we took a look at what it is that we can know and trust about God. Scripture, happenings in communities of faith, things God has revealed to people over the centuries in a variety of other events all point to the fact that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, and all-loving. And we've explored the meaning of each of these statements and what truths mean, these truths mean, and they're real regardless of what we think, feel, endure, or experience. We've talked about the fact that our reality does not determine who God is, that there's no way that our five limited human senses can grasp God totally. And so with these and some other things in mind from the last few weeks, I'd like to move on this morning. And what I'd like to really focus on today as we wrap this series up is how to put ourselves in alignment with the healing power of God. Said another way, what are some things to keep front and center in our life as we journey through life and encounter the need for God's healing? Very simply stated, what can help us heal? We'll hear a few thoughts, but first, some caveats. It should be obvious by now that none of what I am getting into is a piece of cake or simple. This is hard stuff. It takes a lot of spiritual and emotional sweat equity. And another caveat is that when curing and even healing does not seem to be happening, it in no way means that there's something wrong with us or that it's our fault or that in some way our faith is deficient. Please never let anybody say to you, as I have heard it said in a variety of settings, never let anybody say to you, the reason you aren't being cured is you're just not praying hard enough. 
Or if your faith was stronger, this would not be happening. Such a view is utter hogwash. You see, God is not a healing vending machine where if we put in exactly what is right or if we put in just what is enough, that we will get back exactly what we want depending upon which of God's buttons we push. It's not the way it works, and such a view counters the essence of what we know about God through Scripture. God is in charge. We are not. And so with these caveats in mind, let's look at ways and some ways that can help us heal. Well, while perhaps obvious, I just need to touch on it again. It's vital to remember that healing and curing are different. But it's also important to know that we need healing in all kinds of different ways in our lives. We need healing physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, relationally. Sometimes healing is about needing to be freed from anger or hostility or spite or bitterness. For others, healing is about forgiveness, forgiveness towards self and others. Sometimes healing has to do with our character, our, our integrity, or our honesty. The point is, we need to remember to look at healing in a very broad way, that we need healing in all kinds of different ways and areas of our lives. And across these varied areas in which we need healing, is it so important for us to remember that healing has a lot to do with how we define ourselves. All of us here today see ourselves in unique and different ways. The question is, what do we use or rely on to define who we are? Where does our own self-definition come from? How do we describe ourselves and says who? Well, the options are numerous. We can define who we are by what other people say, cultural standards, income, public opinion, hearsay, career, race, relationship status, where we live, age, and a whole lot more. But when it comes to how we define ourselves, and this has so much to do with healing, there are two very important things to keep in mind. First and foremost, it's vital that we work on coming to the place in our lives in which our primary sense of self comes from God. That the foundation of how we see ourselves is God. God made us. God put us together. As one person brilliantly said, God don't make no junk. God's presence is within us. And on this point, listen to these words that Paul wrote in a letter. Listen to these words of Paul. Paul wrote, you realize, don't you, that you are the temple of God? And God himself is present in you? God's temple is sacred, and you, remember, you are that sacred temple. Where are you right now in your life in seeing yourself as being the very presence of God and the temple of God? Do you see yourself as sacred? Is that where your fundamental sense of self comes from? In a life-changing time, King David wrote these words. Oh yes, God, you shaped me first inside then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you. You are breathtaking, God. Body and soul, David writes, I am marvelously made. It's not ego talking. This is coming from a fellow who went through hell, but who finally came to understand that God had made him, and that as a creation of God, full of the Spirit of God, that he was simply marvelous. His response to this understanding of himself, to this healing, was not narcissistic or ego-driven. Rather, it was coming from a place of deep gratitude and profound humility. Recognizing that we are gods, defining ourselves first and foremost as gods, seeing ourselves as the temple of God and as sacred is a game changer and is where the essence of healing starts. When we live first and foremost for our creator and our creator's opinion, not others, our purpose in everything in life shifts. 
That is extraordinary healing. But just as it's important to define ourselves as God, it's equally critical that we don't allow ourselves to be defined by our illness, by our ailment, or by our challenge. Here's what the great Miroslav Volf once wrote. And listen to these words about the importance and what can happen when we allow a suffering to define us. Miroslav writes, the greater the wrong suffered, the more it can get ingrained into the identity of the person who endured it. And when wrongdoing defines us, we take on distorted identities frozen in time and closed off to growth. In less severe cases, the wrongdoing may not fully define us, yet it lodges in our core self and casts a shadow on everything we think and do. Wow. One person writes, what we suffer does not define us at the deepest level. We are not defined by our infirmities. What does this mean? It means that I am not the virus. I am not the cancer. I am not the broken bone or back. I am not the heart disease. I am not the depression. I am not the abuse. Now, these things may be in our lives and what we suffer from, but they are not who we are at the core, even though they may be affecting us at the core. We are not the ailment. We are God's. And aside from taking a look at how we define ourselves, it's so important to take a look at how we talk to ourselves. This is a fundamental aspect of healing. Now, you've heard me say in a variety of contexts that regardless of how outwardly verbal we may be, every one of us here today is quite the inward yapper. Internal chatter continually bombards our minds. And regardless of our awareness, we talk to ourselves day and night and day and night, and the words are potent. They can facilitate our healing and make us more receptive to God's healing, or they can cut, degrade, demote, and harm us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And just as it is vital to define ourselves in light of God, it is essential that we speak to ourselves in ways that are in alignment with what God has to say to us. Now, the secular psychological world has recognized for a long time the importance of affirmations. But this truth has been around for thousands of years. Scripture, in fact, is chock full of life-giving, encouraging, upbuilding, sustaining, peace-inducing, healing, and affirming words of God. And the seeds of healing are planted within our lives when we learn to use, speak, utter, and use God's words in our thinking. When we learn to use God's words as the basis for all that chatter, resilience is unleashed. We need to allow God's voice to come across our lips and into our minds for healing to unfold. We say, I can't do this. God's voice says to say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We say there's no hope. God says to say, I will hope continuously and will praise God more and more. We say, I am scared to death. God says to say, remember, fear not, for I am with you. We say, I don't know how on earth I'm going to deal with this. God says, I did not give you a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and a calm and well-balanced mind. Healing flourishes when our inner chatter reflects the voice of God. And when we need healing, let's get God's voice into our mind. I put a resource for that in your notes. 
Now, just for a moment, I'm going to skim across some other concepts that are central to healing. Each one of these could be a sermon in and of itself, so I apologize up front. But each of these things I want to just skim across all have to do with healing. Take truth, for example. Healing is all about truth-telling. Truth is necessary for healing to occur. Telling the truth to ourselves, telling the truth to other people selectively, and certainly telling the truth to God. This is why one Jewish sage wrote long ago, centuries ago, wrote, the truth hurts like a thorn at first, but in the end it blossoms like a rose. Truth is hard, but truth is needed for healing to happen. Healing depends on truth, honesty, and candor, just as it does on patience and persistence. Healing is an unfolding thing. It's a journey. It's not like taking an aspirin for a headache. It's not a straight line. It's a curvy path, one with bumps and twists and turns and ups and downs. It's more like slowly irrigating a field that has been drought-stricken for a long time. That's what healing is about, and it takes patience and persistence, going at it time and time and time again. And like truth and patience and persistence, healing also requires that we splay ourselves open and become vulnerable. Now, vulnerability is not about sharing our pain willy-nilly all over the place. Vulnerability is about being non-defensive with ourselves, with selective other people, with God. It's about taking the lid off and taking a look at what really is inside. It's about taking the bandage off and getting the wound into the light. Vulnerability is necessary for healing. And with vulnerability, the healing power of God saturates and permeates our being. I wish I could get into prayer, but I can't. That's obvious one that's related to healing. But I want to say just a couple more things about healing, and that is that if we want to foster healing, we need to learn not to resist the fluid, moving, changing nature of life. The more rigid we are, the more we grasp and hold on, the more we block the healing power of God to intervene. If we want to facilitate healing in our life, we need to move toward embracing the moment and letting go of the future and worry over it. And we create fertile ground for the healing power of God when we see life as a flowing, ever-evolving river rather than a fortress that needs to be defended at all costs. And of course, there's much more to say. Certainly, we need to engage other people in our healing process, friends, neighbors, therapists, physicians, nutritionists, coaches, teachers, on and on. That's why James was talking about taking the need for healing into community where other people can be part of that journey. Now, I know I've covered a lot of ground this morning, and I've just touched the surface, and I hope you'll take all the notes, and you'll ponder them, and you'll think about them, and you'll explore them. And as you may remember, uh, at the start of this series, I asked the Holy Spirit to guide some of what we got into. And while I believe this is what has happened in part, I also uh, know that the same Spirit is telling me this is a vast subject. We need to get into it a lot more in a variety of different ways. Because I really want and pray that this chapel will become an extraordinary place of healing. And we're going to work on making that become a reality together. But for now, I want to close this whole series with an image. You may know the image. You may have heard it. You may have come across it. I came across it a number of years ago during a particularly horrendous time in my life. In the image, because it helps me let God be God, is extraordinarily powerful. And it may be powerful for you. And again, you may know the story, but Corey Ten Boom was her name. And during the Second World War, she and her family members hid Jews in a secret room in their house in Holland. Well, they were caught and imprisoned, and Corey saw the worst of the worst, perhaps even saw the incarnation of evil itself. But she survived. And through her 91 years of life, she was an extraordinary witness to the love of God 
and the healing power of Jesus, despite and perhaps because of what she'd experienced. So she wrote a poem called The Tapestry, and it reflects how she saw God in her life. And I believe from where I sit that she was right on. Now, the poem is printed in your bulletin, but I just want to read it. It's short. I want you to listen to these words because they are potent. Here's what Corey wrote. My life is but a weaving between God and me. I cannot choose the colors he weaveth so steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reasons why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. Well, through it all for me in my life, in my walk with Jesus, in the midst of all the joy and all the terrible pain, I think this image of the tapestry gets at the crux of the matter when it comes to healing. That said, however hard it is sometimes, and even when things don't make any sense at all, I think what healing is all about when it's all said and done is to let God be God. And we do that by trusting God. And if we don't have that trust, or if we mightily struggle with it, that more than anything else, that we pray that God will give us trust. This may be why Jesus' prayer in the midst of his torment was quite simple. Thy will be done. Jesus, let God be God. Life is indeed like a tapestry from where I sit, and there are two sides, the top, which is stunning and ordered and beautiful and whole, and the underside with knots going this way and that, threads going in directions that sometimes appear not to make any sense at all, even a chaotic appearance. And while you and I may be blessed in life with just very quick momentary glimpses of the top of the tapestry, for the most part, for now, all we can see is the underside. And at its core, healing unfolds when we trust that the top side is there. That for the moment, the threads and knots of our lives are part of something being created that is too magnificent and too wondrous to imagine. And healing unfolds when we trust that the weaver not only knows what he is doing and is in control, but loves us beyond comprehension. Again, in Corey's words, the pattern he has planned, he knows, he loves, he cares, nothing this truth can dim.